Kinematic indicators are not restricted to thrust zones. We now digress from the Caledonian orogeny to illustrate ductile deformation in the Lewisian gneisses. In this case, the orogeny took place during the early Proterozoic, long before these gneisses provided the basement for the Caledonian foreland. This area of Lewisian happens to be classic for finding uh, evidence for kinematic indicators within shear zones. So while we're here, let's make use of it. The story is that the late Archean Lewisian gneisses were deformed in the, the early Proterozoic, that's about 2,000 million years ago, uh, by a series of, of shear zones. And those shear zones are readily found by tracing out basic dikes. And we can look at the effects of the shear zones uh, where these dikes enter the zone and see what happens to them as they become deformed. Should we go find a dike? OK. Well, this is fairly pale, well foliated, so we're still on the Louisian nice there. Yes, that's pretty, pretty characteristic. OK, well, this looks much darker than the Louisian material. And uh, I have a suspicion that it could well be a suitable dike. I think you're right. Let me just yep. take a sample. I think it's fairly coarse grained. It's fairly coarse grained. It's got some nice little phenocrysts in it, though. And I think there's no doubt we'd call that a dolerite. Good. So, it's a dolerite dike, cutting the Louisian, a possible marker for us. A possible marker. Let's follow it along. Right. Well, this is still dike here. And it does seem to be forming this low ridge. Yes, that yes, we can see I going think up it's the hillside. Weathered, exactly, it's weathered proud, and uh, should be able to get a strike off that. Well, that would give us a trend of about 140. Actually, it's pretty much heading up towards the summit cairns. So we, uh, it's a very distinctive rock type and it's uh, been looking at the width on the way up and I think it's a good 20, possibly even 30 metres wide, so it must be one of the larger dikes in this area. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's not, not easy to miss, is it? We've been walking on a bearing of 140 and we're still on the dike, so it's got a pretty consistent trend, 140 up towards the, the crest of the hill. OK, let's get up to the yep. top then. Well, we've been uh, following the line of the dike along for quite a way. We've got to the top. Up to the top. And, and uh, it stayed with us. Now, unless I'm mistaken, this rock over here looks a little bit paler. <laughs> well, I don't think this is dike, is it? No. It has a very strong fabric. It's much paler than the dike. Certainly Lewisian. Yeah, it's, it's our Lewisian nice, but with now a, a, a fabric that is almost vertical. Ah, oh, now that's interesting, because everywhere else I've seen the Louisian, it's been a very, very flat-lying fabric. That's, yeah, it has. And I think we can see that the grain shape is rather more extreme than we've seen in the Louisian before. Right. So we have hit a deformation zone. OK, and, and the dike has gone. So yeah. it's either been deflected or it's just stopped dead when it entered the, the shear zone. Yeah. What's your bet? I think we, uh, we look for the dike. OK. <laughs> and, uh, yes, there's a line of pretty dark rocks, dike-looking rocks down there. So it's quite possible that the dike's been deflected in that direction. Well, that would give us a direction of around about 100. So that would imply a, at least a 40 degree change in orientation of the dike. OK, well, let's follow it along to uh, see if that's what's actually happening. Well, 
Paul, we've come down quite a way now, about 200 metres from the Cairns. Yeah, about that. And on a bearing of about 100. And we picked up the dike continuously, so it certainly didn't disappear, it was deflected. Indeed it was. And there appears to be some fabrics in this dike, which we didn't see before. Before it was fairly massive. And now, this rock here, the, the felspars, the pale parts are extremely uh, strongly streaked out and the uh, orientation seems to be parallel to the direction of the dike at this point. And I also I noticed coming down that the dike has uh, thinned considerably. I mean, it can't be more than about five metres thick by this point. Would mm -hmm. you expect that, those sorts of changes in the shear zone? Well, you would, because if you're going to stretch it out in one direction, increase its length in one direction, then you're going to have to thin it in the opposite the, the direction at 90 degrees uh, or else change its volume very dramatically. So yes, I would expect to see it much thinner in the, in, in, within the shear zone. I find it amazing that uh, a dike which is, is not that large, uh, geologically speaking, uh, can retain its integrity while undergoing such strong shearing. Once you start to get ductile deformation, where the individual grains of the rock can change their shape and accommodate the deformation, then you, do, you don't have to rupture, you don't have to fracture. You can just simply stretch and change the shape in that way. And that's what's happening here. We have a dike that comes in and is deflected hundreds of metres over to the east. And in terms of kinematics, what does all this tell us? We're being told then by the dike that this shear zone had a sinistral, to the left, sense of movement on it. So the dikes proved to be a, a pretty powerful kinematic indicator. It's about as good as they get, yes. By tracing out the dike, observing its changing width and the changing orientation of the fabrics within the gneisses, the resulting map clearly shows a sinistral shear zone, about 100 metres wide within the Lewisian basement.